Hello, everyone, and welcome to Inside Leather History, a fireside chat. I'm Doug O'Keefe and the producer of the chats, which are a program of the Leather Archives and Museum. Today, it's a very cold January evening, the 19th of January in Chicago. I hope Oklahoma City is a little warmer. Yeah, today I'm interviewing Tiffany Olson. Tiffany is the second international Ms. Transgender Leather. You held that uh, title for about three years, isn't that right? In theory, I still do, so yeah. Oh, okay, okay, very good. You're in Oklahoma City, and you said it's not, as, not any warmer than Chicago. Actually, Tulsa, but yeah, it's, it's like in the 30s here, and it's cold and windy and miserable. Oh, okay. Uh, I've heard that there is some community in Tulsa. Oh, yeah, there's a big community, all, all sorts of fun people. We have our huge pride parade. We have our Equality Center, which is uh, the source for most resources here around Tulsa. We've got a, a great little, little community here for being such a, uh, a little blue spot in the red state. Why is it so liberal? Uh, all the gay people showed up here. I don't. I don't know. <laughs> of all places, okay. Well, let's start right at the very beginning. Tell me a little bit about where you're from and your growing up and your family. Okay. Um, average um, parents. Uh, very blue collar. Um, dad was a pipe fitter. Uh, mom was, well, she was kind of in, did real estate and did a dental hygienist thing and kind of bounced around for that. And of course, you know, the whole homemaker thing. Um, but yeah, average American middle class uh, doesn't get much more white bread than me, unfortunately. It's uh, pretty much standard stuff. Uh, of course, I was kind of the, the weird one. You know, I always had these interesting feelings that I wasn't quite fitting into my skin or my life or the world around me for sure. Uh, so that's was early age, about six, six years old, you start feeling something's wrong and uh, you don't quite act like the, the other kids do and you don't quite fit in with the boys, you don't quite fit in with the girls. Uh, Parents weren't thrilled about that, of course, as parents uh, are wont to do, especially back in the 70s and 80s. They weren't quite as enlightened as they are now. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, um, I learned to hide all that from a very early age. Your family is from Oklahoma? Uh, actually, my mom is from Canada and is still a Canadian citizen, actually, oh. but she lives in Muskogee. Um, Dad, has been in Oklahoma most most of his life. So yeah, he's pretty much an Okie. And he's a, you know, right wing Republican redneck gun nut. So yeah, go figure. Goodness. You mentioned being age six and realizing you weren't fitting in, that you were a little different. Tell us more about that. Well, let's see, um, this is, I was smarter than, smarter than everybody else, of course, right? Uh, <laughs> not, nothing to do with gender issues at all. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, um, I always kind of felt like I was, I should have been um, a girl and I tried to spend more time with the girl, but you know, at that age, the girls don't think the, they think the boys are icky. So I kind of got shoved back into being with the boys and all the, you know, the rough housing and the rude stuff that boys do. I just uh, wasn't, wasn't me, uh, never got into sports. Um, kind of just became an introvert hiding in the corner and just kind of doing my own thing, had my books. So I was, I was pretty good, pretty okay with that most of the time. So, yeah. Did uh, anyone try to draw you into more of the games that were going on or the things children were doing? Uh, once in a while, um, I just wasn't very good at most of the games they were playing. So I, mm -hmm. uh, after a while, you just kind of stop getting asked. So you just get used to spending time by yourself and you know yeah it wasn't until high school I actually started making like real friends anyway my goodness that's a long time it's a long time still wow. socially awkward so yeah how awkward I mean was this not ever addressed by anyone um there were a few parent-teacher conferences <laughs> involved um 
I think the general consensus was I wasn't causing trouble, so it was fine. Uh, and since I was doing lots of reading, I was learning lots of things. Um, I always got good grades in uh, you know, English and math, at least early on. Um, seemed like my teachers always liked, liked my, my uh, papers that I was writing, so that's always a bonus. <laughs> What kinds of things were you reading and learning? I uh, got into Greek mythology in like fourth grade. Uh, so I read uh, the Odyssey and the Iliad, um, and that jumped me over into some fantasy stuff like a Tolkien, Lord of the Rings, Hobbit, stuff like that. And from there, it kind of went sideways into, into sci-fi. So uh, it's about the time I... Uh, found Star Trek. So that was, that was the end of uh, my innocence. <laughs> What's your favorite version of Star Trek? Uh, I'm, I'm kind of old. So my heart is always with the, the original series. I'm there with you. Who's your favorite character? Um, it's hard to uh, choose between Kirk and Spock just because oh. they're kind of a team. And then if, if, if you stick, stick McCoy in there, they're all kind of just a, a single entity with, you know, three different minds. <laughs> you said things started to change in high school and you actually had a few friends. Tell us more about that. Well, I actually found some geeky friends who like to sit around and, and read and um, play with computers, uh, spend time in the library, uh, started playing some... Uh, science fiction, Star Trek based uh, board games and role playing games while we were um, at, at lunchtime. Uh, have a soft spot for, for Starfleet battles and the old uh, fast Star Trek stuff. So, At what point in high school, though, did you really find something that spoke to you? Uh, well, it was the 80s. So um, boys were wearing makeup and dressing film. And I'm like, hey, I could do that, right? Um, so I kind of felt a little bit of a kindred spirit with some of the um, folks on MTV. Because, <laughs> you know, they could be whatever they wanted to be, basically. They could dress how they wanted. They could wear makeup if they wanted. They could do whatever they wanted to do. Um, about the time we all found out that George Michael was gay. I mean, <gasps> how, how could this author? awful thing happened, you know. I'm like, dude, you're cool. <laughs> How were you experimenting? What did you do? Um, about then I started to do some cross-dressing at home. Um, occasionally I would wear items of you know, feminine clothing to school, nothing obvious, of course. Uh, maybe uh, jeans, maybe the, just a, a t-shirt. Uh, was wearing uh, necklaces back then, but then again, everybody was. Uh, I didn't have the guts to get my ears pierced back then. So <laughs> that took a little bit longer. That took a little bit longer. Um, Did you experiment with makeup? I did one time uh, and that did not go well. Um, one of my teachers called my parents mm -hmm. and said that I was wearing makeup. Uh, actually, uh, through high school, I was in Air Force ROTC. So I'm pretty sure it was the colonel in charge of that that uh, informed my parents that I was a little out of line there. But a very um, interesting television program impacted you. Tell us about that. Yeah, I was watching Phil Donahue uh, one afternoon when I was at home for some reason. And there were um, people who were identifying as the opposite sex, a transgender folks. And that was the first that I had ever heard of this, this thing, that someone could transcend genders and live as you know, a woman or a man. And they were comfortable and they were happy. And I'm like, holy crap, that's a thing. And, uh, you know, small town of Oklahoma, you don't see a lot of uh, stuff about transgender folk and there wasn't any books in our school library about it because uh, I, I looked really hard to try to find something. 
Um, but at least that showed me that there's other people like me and that maybe I'm not quite so alone and not quite so weird. <laughs> so that was great. You thought you, you thought you were weird. I still think I'm weird, but that's okay. 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 How did that begin to evolve for you? You said there was nothing in the school library. What other right. resources did you try to use? Uh, went to the uh, local uh, town library and I found one book uh, about uh, transgenderism. I think it was Conundrum, but I can't remember the author at, at this time. But at least that's let me know that, yeah, there are things out there. Um, and then, you know, from them, from then, every time I went to uh, bookstores in general, I was looking for uh, stuff on on trans folk. Um, get a lot of weird looks when you're asking about uh, those kind of books sometimes, especially when you're, you know, look like it, the you know, average, average dude. So. Um, what does an average dude look like? Um, heck if I know. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us what you began learning as you found these resources. Uh, I learned that um, people can medically transition. They can do a little nip tuck and Bob's your uncle and you can have all the other parts, which was you know, shocking to me. I'm like, they can do things like this? It's like magic. Um, so I started reading up on you know, the, the surgeries and who was performing the surgeries and people that had the surgeries. Um, Cause about that time, there was lots of uh, autobiographies uh, featuring you know, trans folk after they had you know, transitioned. Um, and it was becoming more and more of a sensationalized thing, I guess. I uh, started seeing a lot, of, lot more of us on talk shows, uh, not always being shown in the best light, but at least we're out there. So it's, if we can you know, at least show that we're not uh, deviants or horrible people or child molesters, you know, the whole thing. Um, it's nice to see other people that are a, a positive role, role model uh, as opposed to, you know, the, the media where all the trans folk are either uh, prostitutes, uh, dead prostitutes, uh, serial killers, <laughs> all, all that sort of thing. So uh, it was very difficult to find a, a positive portrayal so uh, just kind of have to had to you know look towards the future and hope that it, you know more stuff about trans folk would come out be more accessible and of course later on the internet popped up and that was a, a whole new world right there what, do you remember which biographies you found that were beneficial um if i can remember half half their their, their names now um I know I saw the one about uh, Christine Jorgensen, mm. of course, mm. she's the one, most, most, most famous one. <clears throat> um, oh, I can't remember her name now. I'm horrible keeping up with, with, with names. If you hadn't asked me, I, I, I probably could have told you. That's, That's okay. <laughs> I just wondered because other people someday are going to see this and they'll probably wonder which ones they should uh, view, you know. Right. Tell me a little bit about the emotions that, that you felt and the concepts that you suddenly knew from that Phil Donahue broadcast. Well, it definitely uh, got me very curious and excited. Um, wanted to know everything about it. I wanted to find other people that uh, identified that way. Um, I wanted to be part of that, because I knew that was that was me. Uh, even in those early days, it's like, oh yeah, that's exactly how I feel. That's exactly what I want, and um, that kind of started my entire journey right there. Uh, so from that point on, I started trying to live a little closer to my true self when I could. Um, still very much in the closet back then. Uh, it took me, uh, God, until the 90s before I actually got 
brave enough to actually, uh, you know, do the whole thing, go out, actually left the house, uh, met, met up with other, other people like me and started having fun finally, instead of being scared to be me all the time. Tell us about the first time that you went out of the house dressed as you felt was appropriate. Okay. Um, actually, the, I think the very first time I went out was uh, I had talked to my wife at the time uh, about it, and she got excited a couple of times because I was a big Barbie doll, really. Um, so she got me all uh, gussied up and found me a dress, and we kind of went out driving around, which we never actually got out of the car, but at least we were you know, out of the house. Um, so anything could happen. It was, you know, it felt, felt dangerous at the time just to be out driving around, uh, as my true self, because I never knew someone would just happen to see me and something would happen. Um, it wasn't until after I got divorced, which was probably for the best in, in retrospect, uh, that I got to actually, uh, start participating more in my own life. Um, that was a time where I first got a real computer, got on the internet, started going into the, the chat rooms, um, found a few, a few people in Tulsa that were um, like me. And eventually I actually found a person and we set a date to, to meet up, all dressed and went out to a, uh, a gay bar, drag club, whatever you wanna, wanna, wanna call it. And we had the best time. Uh, it was just amazing just to be us, just for the first time to actually go out in public, um, be seen as women instead of just, you know, some weird dude. <laughs> How long were you married? Uh, six very long years. Oh. Well, your wife had to have been very open-minded to have accommodated you uh, dressing as a woman. Yeah, at, at, at first she just thought it was uh, something fun to do. Um, but of course, once I had a taste, I wanted to do it more and more and more. And eventually she just got fed up with it and annoyed. And then came all the stuff like, you know, you're not man enough for me. And things kind of went downhill from there. Mm. It was nice while it lasted, but uh, sometimes things just don't work out like you hope they do. Tell me more about the progression of transgender because you went driving around, but I assume that the coming out and going to a gay bar was a little bit later. What happened in the meantime? Um, I was still cross-dressing at home. Uh, my wife and I kind of had a deal where she would go out with her friends. I could have the house to myself to do whatever I wanted to do. And that was usually my time to uh, experiment with makeup and hair and uh, try on clothes and do my own little fashion show in the, the living room for the cat because they were the only one that would actually watch. Um, but at least you know, I had some quiet time. I got to think a lot about my, what I wanted my life to be and uh, got lots of dressing time. So that was, that, that was kind of nice. It's just when she came home was when the, the issue started. Because <laughs> I had to be, had to be uh, washed up and back into the boy mode by, by, by the time she got home or there, were, there would probably be a fight. So tell me what you learned with uh, doing makeup. How did you learn about these things and, and about dressing? Tell me uh, more about that. Lots of trial and error, mostly. I think like, like most women do. Um, started getting uh, magazines like you know, Cosmo. Uh, started trying to do the stuff that they, they were doing and dress you know, somewhat like, like the models. Uh, obviously, my budget wasn't quite the... Uh, what the magazines had, but I did my best. Uh, found a couple looks that looked, you know, not 
too terrible on me. Uh, found a couple of makeup looks that uh, seemed to suit my face. Uh, got rid of the uh, bright blue eyeshadow. And the, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And the entirely two red lipstick and um, learned how to kind of tone things down for a more, you know, realistic look, not, not, not full a drag queen, I guess. Were you working with anyone at all? Was anyone teaching you anything? Uh, no, no, not until I, you know, got uh, divorced and got on the computer. I really didn't have anybody that was help, helping with, with things. Uh, my wife showed me a couple of tricks here and there. Uh, but again, you know, she got bored pretty quick with, with that. Um, it's just you watch lots of uh, television and look at magazines and you try to, you know, see the looks that on people that kind of look like you and uh, just try to match that as best you can. Uh, yeah, there was, there were some days where I scared myself in the mirror. <laughs> Why? Let's take a step back. Tell me about the gay bar, the drag bar you visited. Yes, yes. Uh, Renegades was what was the place. It was a pretty um, well-known uh, gay bar at the time. Very small place uh, with a you know, stage, um, bar, of course, uh, pool table, as they all do. Uh, and uh, it's actually a very nice place to come out. Everybody there was very accepting. Uh, people told me that I was cute. And, you know, they liked the way that I looked, looked in it in a dress. Um, for the most part, uh, folks were really supportive there. Um, it was the you know, first place that I, I could go where I didn't have to really be afraid of, you know, being me. Uh, I was amongst my people. <laughs> uh, how long were you visiting Renegades? Oh, uh, he probably uh, went there, God, at least uh, twice a month for two years okay. uh, until you know, we found a few other places to go, like, um, let's see, uh, it was a, a dance club that was uh, gay friendly. So we went there a few times. Um, started to expand our horizons and then started going out to normal places, you know, like restaurants and uh, movie theaters, um, you know, as ourselves. And we did get a few looks. Um, my friend at the time is like six foot three. Oh my. Um, you know, I'm five nine. We're we're not small petite girls by any means. So I think we kind of stood out. Uh, not to mention we were probably dressed a little inappropriately. Um, oh, so uh, tight clothes, short skirts, probably way too much makeup. Um, had a thing for boots with heels. Um, probably fishnets at that time. So yeah, I. Mostly look looked like a hooker, I think, probably. But uh, was that intentional? Um, I think partly, uh, just because I was kind of wanting attention, uh, and that was the best way that I knew how to get it at the time was to dress a little provocatively and kind of see what what happened. Uh, it was kind of experimenting, testing the waters to you know see if anybody would uh, would say anything and. Um, we didn't have too many bad encounters, but there were a lot of people talking behind our backs, um, saying all sorts of, you know, things, Homo homophobic slurs mostly, you know, how, how that goes. Uh, I hesitate to say the words here because it's a, a family show. How did you manage that? Um, at first, the few, first few times that I, you know, heard people talk about me, I was kind of devastated. It's like, I mean, I'm just trying to be me, and these people are already, you know, slinging hate at me. Um, I learned pretty quick that if you want to be a trans person and live your life, you have to develop a, thin, a, a thick skin pretty quickly. You can't let this stuff get to you. Uh, you can't let how other people feel uh, dictate your life. You were obviously working during all of this time. How, yes. did, how did it affect you professionally? 
Well, uh, at the time I was working at as a uh, car stereo installer. So it's a fairly, you know, boyish job. Um, I was kind of doing the, the very subtle transition thing, letting my hair grow longer, uh, dressing a little bit more feminine here and there. Um, actually, it took about a year before my boss even noticed anything. <laughs> and then I'm, you know, suddenly people are calling me ma'am and miss, and my boss is trying to figure out who they're talking about. Because um, if they're outside in the shop talking to me, it's, it's, they're all, always using a feminine, pro, feminine pronouns. And then they go back to talk to my, my boss using those pronouns and he has no idea who they're talking about. And then I come in and they, they point at me and then it's like, oh, him. And they're like, huh? So yeah, there were a, a few interesting moments there. Um, got lots of weird looks, had a couple of people um, refuse to be served by me. Uh, they didn't want me working on, on, on their vehicles, didn't want me you know, anywhere around their stuff. Um, yeah. Actually had a, uh, a preacher cuss me out for being a, a sinner and I'm going straight to hell for being me. And it's like, just try to live my life here, dude. Come on. So that was a fun day. How did you uh, manage all of that in the long run? What did you do? Uh, I just kept on, you know, slowly transitioning. Uh, it probably took me three years uh, to make the, you know, the, the full change. Um, about that time, I was uh, getting research on on doctors to start hormones. Um, you know, actually planning to make a a serious change in my life. Uh, eventually, you know, my boss kind of accepted it, never understood it, never approved, but I was a good worker, so he didn't want to get rid of me. So he kind of just let let, let me do what, what I was going to do. Um, eventually, all, all the, the customers just saw me as, as Tiffany. So it all worked out. It was a good experience. I would have liked to have transitioned uh, a little quicker. But I, I think taking my time was probably the, the, the right thing at that time anyway. How long did the whole process take? Uh, from going from full boy mode to all the way girl mode? Sure. Um, well, I want to start taking hormones and all that stuff probably uh, about three and a half years. Okay. Um, and then after that, it was always, you know, I was, full-time as, as Tiffany, I wasn't trying to do, you know, part-time. Uh, the only time I really kind of butched up was around my parents because they uh, weren't, weren't seriously accepting at that time. Um, and I, at that time, my uh, grandmother was still alive and, you know, she was like my favorite person in the entire world, very supportive always. But uh, when I started growing my hair out, she started getting a little old fashioned with me, you know. Uh, I, I think she kind of knew what, 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 was, what was going on, on with me at that time, because uh, she could see the, you know, the gradual changes. Um, and she even asked me if I had a boyfriend. So I'm like, okay, she knows something here. I haven't told her anything, but, but she knows something. Um, Unfortunately, she passed away before, you know, I fully transitioned. So um, I think she would like the person that I am today, though. At least I hope so. How do you mean? Um, I think, you know, that I am a good person. I uh, do lots of things for the, the community. Uh, I'm a social worker, so obviously I'm into helping people. Uh, I try to maintain the, the calm, collected <laughs> demeanor, uh, and just do the best I can in the world, really. I'd like to take one step back. You, you brought up a, an interesting point about your parents and that you had to butch it up a little bit around them. How did that uh, evolve for you? How did you eventually resolve that issue? Well, um, 
with 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 my my, my mom actually um it's kind of a funny story with, with, with that um so i was heading to tulsa uh you know fully dressed up you know slut wear the whole thing um <laughs> and my truck broke down so who am i going to call i call my mom so she has to come and pick me up and we call the tow truck and she sees me for the, for the first time you know totally um them. And she gave me a weird look and asked me what was going on. Is there anything she needed to know about? I'm like, well, this is kind of me now. And she's like, okay, are you being safe? I'm guessing, you know, she was thinking about <clears throat> uh, being a little slutty and having lots of sex, which definitely wasn't the case. Um, I guess that's where mom's minds go to with the the first thing it's like are you being safe do you have clean underwear you know those, those sort of things <laughs> but that was kind of how i came out to her so that was uh kind of all at once um with my dad it was a little more of a gradual process um had a couple of long talks with him and as i said he's very right-wing republican dude um so he took a lot longer to accept me as i am i think at some point he just uh, figured out that i'm his kid no matter what and if he loved me before there's no reason he can't love me now i just look a little different i'm still the same person overall right so uh, it took him a couple of years to actually come around um he still occasionally has pronoun issues hmm. but uh, he he hasn't used my my dead name in the last three or four years so he's doing pretty good tell me a little bit about uh, the name transition for you I, I have to admit i know almost nothing about that with uh people who have changed their gender uh it's kind of a, a whole, whole process um it's kind of one of those things all trans people Go through. I mean, you got to pick a name, right? You can't just be nobody. Um, so I think I went through about ten different names. I kind of tried on, um, so like Jennifer and Michelle and Patricia, and God knows how many other other names. Um, and then one day I was listening to the radio, and uh, Tiffany came on. Uh, I think we're alone now. Ah, uh, yes. On, once upon a time. And like, huh, she's cute. She's a redhead. Tiffany, huh, that works for me. So I'm like, hey, I'm going to be Tiffany now. Um, I just kind of changed it a little bit to only have one F because I have to be different. Uh, couldn't just be a normal Tiffany, right? No, no, that's that's not me. So yeah, that's how I, I chose my name. It, it's kind of stuck. It's kind of stuck. Everybody says that it, it suits me, even though... I, when most people think of Tiffany, it's usually like a cheerleader or someone bubbly, um, kind of airheaded. And I'm kind of the opposite of that, but somehow it, it still seems to work. Now, what uh, rigmarole did you have to go through for that name change? Oh, God. Um, so for the name change, you have to file all this paperwork uh, with the uh, county clerk. Uh, you have to put your uh, intent to change your name in the newspaper for 30 days oh, in wow. case any of your creditors want to track you down. Uh, so everything is out there. Uh, if anybody cared to look at that little section of the newspaper, they would have known, you know, what I was planning. Um, surprisingly, the process um, for me went fairly smooth. Uh, had my, my court dates. Went up to the judge, told him what I wanted to do, what I was changing my name from, and what I wanted it to be now. And he's like, hmm, you know, you don't look like this other person. So, okay, here you go. I'm, I'll, I'll sign off on that. I'm like, okay, that worked out pretty good. I was, I was expecting a fight, really. I had all, all, hmm. all, all this stuff ready. Like, hey, this is me. This is who I'm going to be. This is, you know, what I want to do. Like, let's figure out how to make this work and then he's like oh, okay here you go so <laughs> that was straightforward okay yeah 
just yeah um had, had a little more trouble getting my uh driver's license changed the the guy at the uh, DM, dmv was kind of like um i don't know that we can do this i'm like court order here you go oh, wow wow <laughs> so he, he finally talked to his supervisor and they said he had to do it so he definitely didn't agree he made his feelings well known that he didn't agree with with, with my, my, my life choices but uh, he still had to do it um unfortunately the gender marker couldn't be changed um even with a court order um back then they wouldn't change your gender marker with, without proof of irreversible gender surgery and it's kind of still that way um and at that time you had not done that is that what no. i understand right right that time i had not done that i had just started taking hormones i see so uh not really any physical changes at all um so yeah eventually um, was that corrected uh not yet it's uh about to be oh I now see. that I finally finally had my uh gender surgery uh have a nice letter from my surgeon um since it's about time to get a, a real ID now, I have to come up with all the stuff for my um, transition and all the court orders for name change, the stuff from my doctor, all that stuff to prove I am who I say I am. I'm not trying to defraud the United States of America. <laughs> so your, your transition is complete, do I understand? Yes, yes it is. As of November 2nd, I completed my, my surgery. Life is very different now. For example? Um, the whole uh, urination thing is, is, is very different. <laughs> that was probably the, the most strangest thing. Uh, you know, it's, it's not like you can just stay in there and, you know, do your thing and not think about it. You actually have to, you know, sit down, get comfortable, kind of make things happen. Um, and it's much, much, much messier. Um, oh. and I still having to uh, dilate, which is the bane of my existence right, right at the moment, which just means I get to stick a hard piece of plastic up into my nether regions for at least 15 minutes, three times a day. Oh my gosh. Sure okay. Everything stays stretched out and, you know, no nothing decides to close up on its own. Oh, I see. I see. It's, it's exciting. Uh, I, I had no knowledge of this. Okay. So one thing though that I've encountered is uh, the transgender circumstances. I have a niece and I've had to, I have chosen, let me rephrase that. I have chosen to reassign gender pronouns all the way back to, uh, ch you know, a babyhood mm -hmm. just for continuity. Right. What are your thoughts on that? Because that was something new for me to learn to do. Yeah, How I do see that. No, I, I think that is a fantastic thing. Uh, in my head, I've always been female, so I've always, you know, gone back and changed my pronouns in my brain, at least, mm. to be female. Um, it's funny when talking to my my, my parents because um, everything is still kind of he. Um, they haven't quite switched over in their brain, but when I when they, they get to a certain point in my timeline, suddenly the pronouns change. Uh, so um, we're kind of going farther back each time with, with the female pronouns. Yeah. Yeah. But once you get back to childhood, it's 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 still a he for them. Yeah, that that was a learning experience that uh, I had to learn. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was educated by a couple of people I know who said that that would be the best way mm -hmm. of dealing with the pronoun change was just to redo it all together. Right. Yeah, because so, if, if you're out talking to someone that doesn't, does, doesn't know you and you're switching uh, pronouns and genders, uh, they're going to be totally confused. It's, it's best yeah. just to try to stay consistent. So now she's she all the way back to being an infant. Mm -hmm. So that's yeah. awesome. Good job. Good job. Well, thank you very much. You um, tell, 
Tell me a little bit more about who you've become in the community now. What things have you learned about being in, for example, the overall LGBTQ XYZ community? Uh, it's a very welcoming place. Um, for the most part, it's very warm and comfortable. Um, people usually don't judge you by your appearance. Um, they're more flexible as far as um, seeing you as the person that you are. Um, that's why I always try to do it as much as I, I can for the community to kind of give back some of that welcome, welcomeness and uh, warmth that uh, they gave to me. I think uh, it's our job as uh, more <laughs> mature mm -hmm. folk to, you know, start cultivating the, uh, the uh, young ones to, you know, feel comfortable in that world and as, them, as themselves. How are you doing that? Um, I get a lot, lot of friends that have uh, trans kids or they, they know or have friends that have trans kids. Um, they ask me to talk to them a lot. So um, I try to be, you know, very encouraging and say, this is, this is how, how you want to live. That's totally your choice. If you change your mind later, that's cool too. I um, just have to let people know how you want to be, what you want to be called, um, what pronouns you want. If you don't want any program pronouns, they can, we can do that too. Totally up to you. Make, make, make sure that they have, you know, all the uh, information that they need to make a choice. Okay. As to how they want to live their, their life. How did you find the medical community's reaction toward your reassignment? Um, well, when I was shopping around for a, a plastic surgeon to do my breast augmentation, um, I thought it would, would be pretty easy. You call up a doctor, you know, you make an appointment, you go up there, they look at you, they go, sure, give money, and they do the thing. Um, I ended up calling 30 plastic surgeons uh, around Tulsa, Oklahoma City, and none of them were willing to work with a trans person. Um, wow. They just told me that, oh, we don't do that here. And I'm like, it's, it's huh. a breast augmentation. I mean, if, if a, a woman walked in there tomorrow and wanted one, you'd say, sure, let's do this. Um, but me, they, were, they kept, kept saying no. Um, after that, I stopped disclosing that I was trans uh, when I was talking to the, the, the office and, and the surgeons. Uh, one place I even, even put in for, for exam. Uh, at that time, I had some breast development and was, you know, fairly feminized at that point. Um, so they, you know, look, looked at me and said, sure, we can, we, we, we can do this. You know, they didn't bother looking look at my pants, thankfully, uh, as they probably shouldn't be. Um, but had a deposit down, had the surgery date set. Uh, about a week before the surgery, they called, say they had to cancel because um, they looked at my medication list and it indicated that I was not a natal female and uh, they were not interested in working with me. So that one went bust. Um, after about 30 more phone calls, I finally got a hold of a doctor in Tulsa who was reluctant to talk to me, but I kind of begged for us to meet in person so he could you know get get to know me and my motivations and you know make make a, a decision from there and uh, we, we did that we talked for like an hour uh he was very very curious uh and then he just suddenly goes you know there's no reason why we can't do this and i'm like hells yeah so i uh, finally set a date and did it so did you consider perhaps going elsewhere? Uh, yeah, um, I mean, there's always, there's all, what, at, at that time, uh, Canada and Thailand were kind of the two 
big alternatives to any, anybody in the States. But um, I was a very poor girl and uh, couldn't afford to make that uh, kind, of, kind of travel commitment, uh, not to mention, uh, you know, not having any kind of support system uh, to go quite that far. So it was just made more sense uh, in my mind anyway, just to go closer to home, even though it cost me way more frustration than it probably should have. Did you encounter similar problems for the additional work? Uh, no, thankfully, uh, since I just did it recently, um, there are surgeons who specialize in transgender surgery popping up all over the states. Oh. So um, I did a little bit of research, found uh, the Crane Center in Austin, called them up, asked a lot of questions. They sent me lots of uh, information stuff, and I made my choice to go there. And uh, they were very friendly and eager to help, and anything I ever needed, they were happy to get me. So they were amazing down there. That's great. That's great. I was very happy. <laughs> Let's talk about your contest, the International Ms. Trans Transgender Leather. Mm -hmm. Tell us about that contest. Okay, well, it kind of started um, when one of my friends was uh, developing a transgender contest um, in Louisiana. South Central Miss Transgender Leather uh, was the first step. And uh, I was very reluctant. Uh, I ended up kind of doing it as a favor to her. Uh, thank you, Samantha. <laughs> um, but that kind of kicked off the thing. I was very, very scared. Uh, I'm not exactly a, a social animal and talking in front of people uh, is difficult sometimes. So having to be up there in front of these judges that are kind of staring at you, uh, trying to do your little spiel and you know do the modeling thing and to show them that uh, you're not too crazy and are, are willing to be a part of, of the uh, community. Um, that was a uh, very interesting couple of days. Um, I had been told I was going to have competition and uh, ended up one person popped up like last minute, like 15 minutes before the contest started, basically. Oh, I... And she was very uh, new to everything. Um, I think what killed her chances is she brought up uh, Fifty Shades of Grey to the, the leather folk. And uh, that didn't go so well. Really. Oh, no. So I felt kind of bad for her, but, you know, it's learning experience and all. Uh, and you mentioned Samantha. She was the first uh, Ms. Transgender Leather. Right. Yeah, about uh, 2013 or so, isn't that right? Right, yeah. Okay. I'm sorry, and where was it held? You mentioned Louisiana? Yeah, I think it was Shreveport. Okay. It was a very long was, time ago. <laughs> this was a standalone contest. Right. Okay. How big of a contest was it? Was it well populated? Um, it was a pretty small uh, bar, basically. Okay. Uh, okay. There's probably you know the five or six judges, uh, tally, tally people, um, Samantha, me, a couple of uh, boot blacks, and maybe thirty people in attendance. On oh. top of that, so it wasn't a very big crowd, which was probably a good thing for my my nerves. Uh, and thankfully, they had a very bright light shining on me, so I didn't have to actually see anybody. So that was kind of helpful, too. But you said you did it as a favor to Samantha. Yeah, I really hadn't ever thought about uh, com competing. Um, I had won a, a contest previous, a few years earlier, as uh, Miss Oklahoma Tea Girl. Um, okay. Very small local contest. Uh, and what did and, that entail? Uh mostly just a, a fashion show, some very okay. um, silly questions. Um, and I think it was my shining personality that, that I won them over. Very good. Or my butt in that dress, maybe. I'm not quite sure which one, but yeah. 
a small contest. What were your thoughts on being a public figure? Um, I was not ready for that. Uh, I had kind of anticipated going to this, uh, the contest, uh, losing and going home gracefully and not have to think about it anymore, but then I won. And suddenly there's all these other commitments you have to have to make. I had to commit to go into um, international, I uh, had to commit to go into the different uh, leather events, do educational stuff. Um, so suddenly I'm an educator and uh, that took me a little time to settle into as well, trying to figure out you know, some kind of class to do, um, something I wouldn't fail at too horribly. What did you do? Um, my first couple of classes were just basic uh, transgender 101. Oh. Um, it's really basic information about what transgender is, because uh, even at the places where there's lots of leather folk, uh, trans people are still very much a minority, and people have questions. They want to want to know what we're all about. So I was happy to to do that. Um, got into some really good discussions actually about um, gender roles and how strictly we should adhere to those and all sorts of cool things. Where were you teaching this? Uh, I think it was, uh, there was one South Central, I think. Okay. Um, and another was in Oklahoma that isn't around anymore, a tribal fire, that, that's what that one was. Okay. Okay, I've heard of it. Tell me about the international contest. Um, well, again, uh, I had kind of wasn't quite sure I was ready for that, but uh, at this point, I'm kind of all in. So uh, get all my stuff together, uh, get someone uh, to kind of help me out because everybody, everybody needs a, a chaperone, right? Um, keep, make sure I get there on, on time and whatnot. Uh -huh. And yes. uh, got there. Um, and, Where was it held? Uh, <laughs> I keep asking the questions. Was uh, it keep, Atlanta? Yes. Yes, it was. Good yeah. job. Thank you. Um, so my brain is full of holes these days. I'm, I'm, I'm getting old. <laughs> You're younger than me. <laughs> uh, not, not, not by much. But yeah, I, I get there and um, I find out that I'm only contestant again oh boy uh, and but this time there is a mr transgender leather also um so he was super cool um a nice guy from australia as you've d chris yes yes, yes. Yeah. um super nice guy uh he really helped me through it because i was kind of in shambles a nervous wreck and he was too, even though he's amazing. So we kind of helped each other uh, with pep talks and say, yeah, you're awesome. You got this, no worries. And somehow we both got through it and both ended up with, uh, with titles. <laughs> you were competing at the same time? Yes, yes. Oh, I see, I see. Yeah, same contest. Uh, I think I went first then he went first the next time and you know, back and forth like that. Okay. But yeah, same judges and everything. What was the biggest challenge for you doing that? Um, again, talking in front of people that I didn't know and tried not to look like an idiot, trying to sound like I actually knew what I was talking about. Hmm. Um, at the time, I was kind of still a little inexperienced with the leather world. Um, I'd actually only been immersed in that for a couple of years and only from you know one kind of point of view, um, mostly the, the BDSM side. Okay. Uh, so I had to do lots of research on, on leather and I found out it means something different to everyone. Yes. And there's not a real good definition. So when the judges are asking me, what is leather? And I'm like, uh, um, okay, to me, it's about community, um, helping others, uh, being involved in something bigger than yourself and the sex and spankings don't hurt. So. 
how have people reacted to you? Do they see you as a community leader? Do you see yourself as a community leader? Um, I really don't always see myself as a community leader. Uh, I have people telling me all the time that I am, that now I'm a, a role model, um, a source of information and support. And I think that's amazing. I don't always, like I said, don't always feel that way myself because I still feel like the little shy girl from you know 10 years ago. Um, don't think I've changed that much. But being around all these amazing people and uh, attending lots of play parties where I spend most of my time naked, you tend to look, get a bit more self-confidence. Uh, That's wonderful. Right? It's a great world. It's a great world. How do you see the inclusion of people in the various contests now? We've seen transgender winners at IML, for example. Right, right. Um, how do you see that? I think it came far too late. Okay. Um, uh, the uh, transgender contests were kind of a reaction to one of the IMLs where a trans person won yeah. and a lot of the community didn't think that that was right. That was Tyler McCormick. He, he yes. was the first transgender winner. Yes. 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 He's a super nice guy too. Yes. <laughs> super nice guy. Um, so that shifted, you know, focus over to, well, I guess we'll just have a contest for, for trans people. Yes. We, you know, we don't have to worry about being discriminated against or hated on for winning titles. Um, but then you know, after I had the international title for a couple of years, um, the wind started changing in the major leather titles. Um, they started to become more inclusive and trans people could compete. Yes. And trans people could win. Um, so I think the time of separate contests is over now mm -hmm. and everything's just going to be one big inclusive thing. And I hope that stays that way for the foreseeable future. Cause I would hate for it to go back the way it was where there was so much, you know, discontent and hate and crap being slung around about some amazing people. Well, I, I can't see it the genie going back in the bottle and let's hope it doesn't um, yes. as it is now so normalized. Yeah. I'm it, not aware it, people think much of it, you know? No, the people I've talked to now just feel like it's a normal thing. Uh, they don't really mm. have any opinions one way or the other. It's like people competing. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm like, yes, finally. Yeah. <laughs> Equality, equity. Yay. Your title only lasted about uh, two contestants, I think two contests. Isn't that right? Yeah, yeah. There was uh, mm -hmm. 2014 and 15. Okay. Uh, they, they did a contest in uh, 2016. Um, and there was one girl that was competing with me, but again, she was very new. Um, her thing with leather was she was a leather worker. She oh. worked with leather instead of the leather community. Mm. So there was a little disconnect there, but she tried really hard and she was super nice. Um, at least <laughs> until the end, she was a little mean to me, but that, that's okay. I don't hold any grudges. Where do you see the trans community in maybe, let's say five to 10 years? Um, I see it pretty much integrated in with the overall uh, community. Um, I think there's always going to be um, a need for a separate space for trans people just to spend time with, with each other. Mm -hmm. But I think um, they shouldn't be forced to be in that space. They should have the option of being in the wider community when they want to be. And if they need the safe space just to be with trans people, then they should have you know, that, that option. Um, since it's becoming more and more accepted, people are transitioning at a much younger age. Um, I 
have seen people talking about transition at 12. My gosh. Wow. Like, Whoa. It's like, good for you, folk. Uh, it took me till my 30s to <laughs> get all my crap into, in, into place. But there's a lot more education now. There's more information available. Um, there's more role models in the trans community. Um, we're just more out there now and yeah. not quite as uh, ostracized and uh, portrayed as evil, evil people anymore. Fascinating, though, that that uh, attitude adjustment is very recent. It really is. It, I, was, yeah. I was shocked how fast that that went. Um, I think it was kind of a, a rebound because uh, all the community was pissed off at the other half of the community for being mad about trans people competing. And they just kind of went, eh, we don't need you anyway. We're just going to invite them in and yeah. make them welcome and do what we do. So, My niece just uh, turned 25 and is somewhere in the middle of all of this. I'm not exactly sure where. But uh, I've been as supportive and as uh, wonderful as I can be about this because it certainly a major adjustment and, and all you can yeah. do is just be there to hold them up and support them. Yeah, people That's, always talk about how stressful uh, transition is on the people around you. Yeah. They don't always focus on how stressful it is for you. Yeah. It's like, how is this affecting somebody else? And they forget to ask, are you okay? Is yeah. there anything I can do for you? Is there anything you need? You know, uh, they just figure, that you're doing it, you know what you're doing, theoretically, uh, and they don't ask a lot of questions. But uh, yeah, I'm thrilled that you're you know so so supportive, and I wouldn't expect any anything less from you. Well, I, it would be shameful, flat out, if I weren't. So, you know, it's not something I, I'm choosing to do, but something that I have to do, right? Because it's the right thing to do, right? Exactly. I, I don't see a choice there. No, there, there's no, no reason to be mean about it. There's no reason to be judgmental about it. Right, right. So. What advice can you offer someone who's exploring not only transitioning, but tra transitioning and maybe going for a title? IMSL, IML, whatever. Yeah, I... My advice is to start transitioning as early as you feel comfortable. Um, your body is going to be more accepting of the, the hormones and all the other changes. Mm -hmm. uh, if you could uh, block all the testosterone poisoning, if you're going to male to female, that would be a plus. Um, ask lots of questions. Talk to lots of people in the community. Um, talk to surgeons. Talk to therapists. Um, do all the research you possibly can to make sure that that's what you want to do. Um, and then live your life. Uh, as far as uh, titles, hell yeah, go for it. I would love to see a clean sweep of all the titles one year, all trans folk. I would be, that would just be amazing. I don't think that's unreasonable to uh, no. happen. No. It could definitely happen. It's there's there's a, enough of us now being out and about yeah. and ready yeah. to go for these yeah. titles. What's the biggest misconception about you? Uh, that I'm outgoing and an extrovert, and folks that know me know I'm really very very quiet. Um, with with my job as a social worker, I have to talk to clients. Um, I'm head of a housing department, so I've got, you know, my own staff I have to interact with every day. Um, and they all think that, you know, I'm just a wonderful, happy-go-lucky person, uh, no issues at all. And then I get home and it's like, I don't, don't even want to talk to the cat. Oh, yeah. yeah I can imagine. <laughs> just want to be quiet, sit in the corner, watch TV, read a book, whatever. Um, but most people that meet me out, they think I'm just this extrovert it's it's weird it's really weird tiffany olson thank you
for an amazing interview for Inside Leather History, a fireside chat. Well, thank you. I'm excited to be here and I appreciate your time and I hope uh, people see this and don't think I'm a moron. <laughs> they won't.